What happens when a machine meant to be a nimble fist for light infantry turns into something closer to a heavy glove that can't be put on? The story of the mobile protected firepower program, the vehicle the army named M10 Booker, reads like a modern industrial fable, bold idea. Bureaucratic appetite, engineering compromises, a handful of proud machines built, and then a public, almost painful admission that the whole thing no longer made sense. In the spring of 2025, the army moved to cancel the Booker program. And the plain sentence we got the Booker wrong. From Secretary Dan Driscoll cut deeper than a press release, it exposed a mismatch between doctrine, design, and the realities of the battlefield and logistics. The MPF concept was never glamorous in abstract. It arose from a practical, even lonely problem. Infantry brigades were asking for an organic platform that could go where heavy armor could not deliver direct fire against fortified positions or light armor and help infantry close with an enemy without relying entirely on artillery or air support. In other words, soldiers wanted something that carried the punch of a tank but the footprint and agility of a light vehicle, a pocket-sized bruiser that could travel with light forces, break stubborn defenses, and then get out. That is a seductive problem. Every infantryman loves the image of a vehicle that can roll up with a boom when boots alone aren't enough. But seduction is different from technical feasibility, and the Booker slowly became the kind of compromise that satisfies no one. On paper the Booker looked tidy, a four-man crew operating a vehicle armed with a 105mm main gun derived from older light gun programs, armor scalable to the mission, modern sighting and fire control, and a goal of being transportable enough to support airborne or light infantry operations. The intent was to give infantry brigade combat teams a direct fire asset that could change the terms of an engagement, yet as the design matured, requirements multiplied and the vehicle gained weight, not just metaphorically, but literally, what began as a light asset swelled into a vehicle tipping around the high 30S to low 40S in metric tons. A weight class that effectively stripped it of the very advantage that justified its existence. The Booker could no longer be airdropped into the tight, austere airfields and contested drops that were a core part of the MPF pitch. It could not go where commanders had imagined. That reality, the loss of deployability, is what made the vehicle a paradox. The arc from idea to cancellation is not a single villainous moment, but a sequence. The initial capability gap, the design competition, selection, prototype testing, incremental requirement add-ons, early production, and then the stark operational checks. In 2018 the Army set the MPF program rolling, soliciting designs to furnish infantry brigades with a new, organic direct fire vehicle. General Dynamics Land Systems Griffin II base proposal eventually won after a contest in which BAE Systems M8 arrived offering was later disqualified, GDLS, vehicle was type classified as the M10 Booker in 2023 and entered low rate initial production thereafter. Early public unveiling and deliveries were celebrated as a revival of a capability the U.S. Army had not fielded in decades, and for a time the mood was that doctrine might follow hardware. But then testing and practical, basing questions pushed back. The Army took delivery of dozens of RIP vehicles for test and evaluation and initial issue. Some of those vehicles went to paratrooper units for operational testing, yet by mid-2025 the program had been reassessed and procurement was ended. The vehicles already delivered were left with uncertain fates retained for testing, sent into storage, or repurposed. There is a particularly human, almost cinematic moment in this story that reveals how tangential logistics can be to strategy at Fort Campbell. The home of the 101st Airborne Division, intended to employ some bookers for testing, an engineering survey found that a surprising number of base bridges could not safely support the vehicle's weight. Several of the small bridges on training routes and airfields were rated below the load the Booker put on them, that it is the sort of prosaic pedestrian problem that grinds program optimists into realism, if your light tank can't move across the roads and bridges where your light infantry trains, then its tactical mobility is rhetorical, not real. Those bridge assessments became a vivid metaphor for the Booker's contradiction, too heavy to be the thing it promised to be, readers who no military procurement will see familiar faces in this narrative requirement creep, the sunk cost fallacy, institutional momentum, and the awkward dance between a service's doctrinal wishlists and the industrial base's engineering trade-offs. 
Early on, as the MPF program progressed, more capabilities were asked of the platform, greater protection, more complex electronics, improved survivability. Each item added to the checklist was defensible in isolation, together they piled on weight and cost. Once the vehicle began to exceed the constraints set out for air mobility and tactical roadability, defenders of the program could say, honestly, that the vehicle had more protection or more capability than initially imagined. But capability without role is a luxury the military can hardly afford, particularly in a time of constrained budgets and shifting strategic emphasis toward high-tech, distributed, and unmanned systems. So what did the Booker actually bring? It carried a 105mm M35 gun intended to give IBCTs the ability to defeat light armor and hardened fighting positions that ranges infantry weapons could not reach. It had modern sights, thermal viewers, coaxial machine guns, and a design that, in marketing language, promised upgradability. It was reportedly capable of decent mobility on roads at speeds that allowed it to keep up with mechanized movements, in short, Taken purely as a weapon system on flat ground against limited resistance, it had value. The problem was that its operational envelope, the conditions under which that value mattered, shrank as the vehicle grew, the loss of strategic mobility, the difficulty of transporting it into austere theaters, and the fact that a vehicle at that weight was still not survivable against modern main battle tanks and heavy anti-tank effects made its niche narrow and contested, Contrasts help clarify that narrowing. Look at other countries' attempts at light direct fire vehicles. Some air transportable assault guns or tank destroyers exist in other arsenals, often leaning much lighter, with trade-offs in armor and sustainment. The Russian Sprut SD, for example, is an amphibious, air transportable anti-tank vehicle designed for airborne units. The Italian Centauro family mixes wheeled mobility with sizable guns, but accepts trade-offs in protection. Those designs are honest about their trade-offs, the Booker, by contrast. Try to be both, a serious gun on a platform that, in final form, began to resemble a medium-weight vehicle. The result is a vehicle that pleases nobody, not the airborne commander who wants airdrop capability, not the tank commander who will pit it against heavy armor, and not the logistician whose bridges and transport calculations suddenly require revision. The Booker ended up as an engineering compromise that satisfied the requirements spreadsheet, but failed the soldier's reality check. The doctrinal tension at play is clear. A brigade that lacks heavy armor asks for local armored support, and procurement tries to supply it. But modern warfare's contours are shifting faster than the two to three decade cycle of heavy vehicle design. Where in the Cold War, a new armored vehicle could be justified as part of a predictable force structure. Contemporary conflicts emphasize a mix of long-range precision fires, pervasive unmanned systems, rapid sensor to shooter links, and cheaper expendable munitions that change the calculus of how to support dismounted troops in that environment. The idea of a single purpose, crude light tank has to earn its keep against alternatives, precision guided rockets, armed drones that reach beyond visual range, loitering munitions that can attack hardened points, or modular vehicles that act as sensor launch, or missile platforms rather than gun platforms. The Booker's failure was not simply technical, it was strategic friction. The machine no longer fit the shape of the fight the army thought likely to come. There is a cultural element too, within military institutions. Certain labels carry identity. Soldiers, who belong to armored branches are wary of new categories that blur roles. The army initially avoided the term light tank for MPF, preferring the neutral mobile protected firepower language. Their semantic caution was both political and practical, calling a platform a tank invites comparisons to main battle tanks and questions of survivability, whereas a non-tank label can be used to manage expectations. But semantics do not stop physics. When a vehicle's weight and protection characteristics push it into tank-adjacent territory, a naming becomes a thin veil. That mismatch between name and physics contributed to the program's perception problem, it was labeled as filling a niche for airborne and light forces, but behaved more like a compromised medium vehicle in operation. Another uncomfortable truth the Booker story highlights is the allure and danger of momentum. Once billions of dollars, thousands of engineering hours, and institutional pride are invested, programs acquire their own inertia, even when tests reveal inconvenient facts. Institutional cost, budgetary, reputational, contractual, makes cancellation politically fraught. 
Yet the cancellation of Booker shows that an institution can, after public discomfort, correct itself. In 2025, the Pentagon and the Army move to reallocate funds away from the Booker procurement toward other priorities, citing evolving global events and a desire to accelerate war-winning capabilities. The decision to redirect money into more networked, distributed, and modern systems signals a conscious pivot, not only a technical correction, but a strategic reorientation. There are hard lessons here for future development. One is the importance of strict discipline on requirements. The minute a low-weight vehicle is burdened with high-level protection and multiple annexed roles, the engineering trade space collapses. Another lesson is that procurement cycles must be more agile. The world's operational demands and technology trajectories change rapidly and long. Rigid development cycles risk producing platforms obsolete by the time they are field ready. A third lesson is doctrinal alignment. A new vehicle must be married to a new or adapted concept of operations. If doctrine, logistics, and training don't change in lockstep with the hardware. The hardware sits in sheds or gathers dust on bases. Still, it would be unfair to reduce the booker to a caution retail only. The people who designed and built the vehicle were solving real soldier problems with real engineering skill, the gun systems, the sighting packages, and some of the mobility systems were genuine improvements over what light infantry could previously expect. The army did field vehicles, soldiers trained on them, and engineers learned valuable things about balancing firepower, protection, and mobility. The next generation combat vehicle efforts, the programs aiming to modernize the force more broadly, will take fragments of Booker's technical advances and combine them with concepts shaped by unmanned systems and precision fires in that sense. Booker's DNA will echo forward even if its procurement line is closed, looking forward. The cancellation raises questions that are both technical and strategic. On the technical side, how to design ground combat vehicles that remain relevant amid increasingly capable anti-armor technologies and proliferating unmanned systems. On the strategic side, what mix of heavy, medium, and light maneuver elements is sustainable and effective in peer or near-peer war? The temptation in defense is to buy what feels reassuring, heavier armor, more guns, but strategy demands nuance in multi-domain competition, mobility, endurance, and the ability to integrate with long-range sensors and fires often outweighs single-platform firepower. The Booker episode could shift investment toward unmanned and network capabilities that multiply the effect of lighter platforms without overloading any single chassis that said. There are also sober, practical worries. Cancelling a program leaves a capability gap unless a replacement is ready. Infantry brigades that had been expecting the MPF will have to rely on alternate means, heavier artillery, more integrated air support or partnerships with armored brigades. All of these have costs in terms of responsiveness, footprint, and political risk. The Army's pivot toward drones and other advanced sensors, a policy direction emphasized in defense documents of 2025, is promising. But it must come with firm plans to ensure infantry aren't left exposed while new systems are developed. Transitions, in military terms, are messy and can be dangerous if not carefully managed. The M10 Booker's story is not a morality play with villains and heroes, it is a mirror. It shows how the best of intentions can be undermined by accreting complexity, how institutional processes can turn a targeted capability into a misfit, and how modern warfare is shifting center of gravity, sensors, networks, unmanned systems. Precision alters the calculus for crude fighting vehicles. It also demonstrates that militaries can change course, the Army's public admission and procurement pivot is evidence that self-correction, however politically difficult, is possible. So where does that leave us? And what should viewers and students of defense take away? First, the Booker cancellation is a cautionary tale. Define the mission, then design the tool. Do not fashion the mission to fit the tool. Second, be humble about the pace of change. Ground vehicle design cycles must reckon with a world where unmanned systems and long-range precision fires can rapidly erode the advantage of crude platforms. Third, expect future ground vehicles to be more modular, more networked, and paradoxically, perhaps smaller in function even if they are heavier in structure. Finally, watch the budget lines, dollars reallocated from MPF will not vanish. They will be placed into other programs, drones, 
sensors, or modernization initiatives, and how those funds are used will be the real indicator of the Army's strategic direction. Drop a comment. Do you think future infantry should rely more on networked unmanned fires, or on organic route platforms like the Booker? If the Booker was wrong, what would a right solution look like in your mind? A modular gun chassis, a drone first doctrine, or something else entirely? The M10 Booker may have been shelved, but the questions it raised will shape the next decade of ground combat decisions.